gentlemen, the President of the United States of America, Bill Clinton. Loretta Claiborne is an American Special Olympics advocate, athlete, and worldwide speaker. Over the years, she has met countless global leaders, including presidents, pro-athletes, religious leaders, and civil rights activists. However, when Loretta was young, her dreams seemed unattainable because she was born with an intellectual disability as well as near blindness and clubbed feet. After several surgeries, sports, and running in particular, was her ticket to success. At the same time, Eunice Kennedy Shriver founded the Special Olympics. The games were born out of the Civil Rights era with the first official games held in 1968. Raised by a determined single mother, Claiborne overcame the bullying and poverty of her youth when signed up for the Special Olympics as a teenager. Through it all, she developed her voice, and that voice allowed her to not only speak for herself, but also to advocate for others along the way. Over the years, she has especially enjoyed spreading her message of hope and determination to young people. Now, in her 60s, Claiborne continues to participate in many summer and winter sports, even after all of her success on the track and behind the mic. Loretta, I am so grateful to have you join me today. And I'll just start by asking you how you've been. How have the last six months or so been for you? Uh, it's, it's, it's had its challenges because I like to go to the gym and I'm the kind of person that's my enjoyment and going to my Special Olympic sports. That's my not only physical activity, but that's my social activity. I live totally on my own. And so back home, I'm not currently at my home. I'm out of town with friends. But it's it's a little hard, but I try to make the best of it. I have a saying, you know, faith trumps over fear. And I keep that in the back of my mind. And I just been able to take the time and utilize it to give back, like making my preemie hats for preemies in three different hospitals now. And also doing knitted knockers for women who have breast cancer, I donate them to the cancer people. So those with people with cancer and uh, it's a group called knittedknockers.org. And I've just been utilizing my time with that. And that kind of kills a lot of the time. Well, I mean, that's what you do. And you, you talked about faith over fear. So we'll talk about fearlessness because that's a big theme for you. Um, but your voice, has become your hallmark. You use your voice for good, to help others, to advocate for yourself. Um, when did you find your voice? You know, I, I never thought I really had a voice because when I was very young, I remember, you know, just being in a conversation with a group of kids or something like that. And they always chatted and talked. And of course, I never had that chance to, to talk and they would just like look at me and just like, ah, whatever. You know, that's that's a dumb kid. You don't listen to the retard, which we don't use that word anymore, but I'm yeah. using it in the historical context. Mm -hmm. And I can remember, you know, just being at home at the table and we would chat. And kids always had something to say. And I just thought I never had nothing to offer. So what was the point? Nobody listened to me anyway. And I think I developed my voice more when I was older. I remember being in school and I would put my hand up and the teacher would just overlook my hand. And then I was like, I was the first one that had my hand up. You know, okay, crap. So I ain't gonna even bother to answer question. What's the point? Then I got into Special Olympics and I remember the coach saying to me, Loretta, what do you want to do? Do you want to do the mile or do you want to do the, the, you know, the 440 or the 300? And I would just shrug my shoulders. I, my thought was he's gonna pick it what I'm gonna do anyway, what's the point? And then he looked at me and says, you got a voice and you have to use it. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you want to do? I'm not going to select for you. You need to select what you want to do. I said, I want to do the mile. And he kind of looked at me because he didn't think I could run a mile. And I was running since 1966, before there was even a Special Olympics. Me and my brother used to go running. And then during, as time went by, I had an advocate. And 
I remember her, Deanna McFarland. She says, Loretta, you have a voice. And I want you to uh, use your voice. And I would look at her and just roll my eyes, head my, hang my head down. And she worked for them, what they called the ARC. And it was, it's just the ARC now. It's, it was the Association for Retarded Citizens. She says, you know, I'm going to schools to speak and I would like you to be the person to go with me. And I looked at her, I said, oh, I don't do that. I'm sorry, Miss Janet, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't talk in front of nobody. And then she persuaded me and it was people along the way. And still today, when I look at uh, friends that I have, and I'll sit down and they said, what do you think? And you have to make the decision. I'm not going to make the decision for you. Right now, this was talking to a friend not even 10 minutes ago. The people I'm staying with, husband and a wife group, and the wife said to me, oh, do you really want, what do you want to do with this? And I told her I have to think about it. So it's, do you want to do it? Do you don't want to do it? And it's just one of those tough decisions. And I found out that. I guess, you know, I have to use my voice and I have to make decisions. And I look back and think about all the people that have a voice and, and don't get that opportunity to use it. Hmm. So I believe in, you know, I guess God has given me this voice and I should utilize it to spread his message to, to help others. Loretta, it's, it's one thing to find your voice, but it's another thing to take it to the world's biggest platforms like you have. Do you remember when you started to feel like you needed to do that, that you needed to help people? You know, uh, vaguely, I do remember, and um, it was several years ago, back in the 80s, starting going to local schools when people were still being institutionalized here in the United States with Miss Janet, and she talked me into going to schools and talking to school students about people with intellectual disability. And I started and I came up with a little thing for school kids. And it was about then the word retardation and explaining that. And I said, how many of you eat a loaf of bread? I mean, eat bread. And of course, everyone around the world uses bread or rice, two of the main components of society and of course, water. And the kids would raise their hand and I would say to them, look on the back of the package. This is your homework to go home and look on the back of the package or have your parents read it to you. And it says the word retard to, to slow, to slow the process of your bread going bad. That's what that means. It means just to slow. So people who have that condition, I said, it just said they learn slower. There's nothing wrong with them. They're not going to give you a disease. They don't have an illness. It's just a slowness. And can they learn? Yes, they can. It just takes them a little extra time. Then I would end up and say, you know what? We're all slow. You might be good at math, but are you? can you run 100 yards in 12 seconds? And the kid would shake his head, no. I said, so you have something that you're slow at. I said, everyone. There's no person that is good at everything. And I use that in the, as an example to these elementary students. And as time went by, I was asked for Special Olympics to speak on their behalf. And then it was this local state things that I would go. Then I was asked to be on the board of directors of Special Olympics. Then I knew, <laughs> can I really do this? I was shaking in my shoes. It's like, I don't think this is for me. And I remember being on the Special Olympics on the board for Special Olympics Pennsylvania. And the first time I was on the board was in like 1982. And I still have my board card and it just said I was a member of the board, but I just sat there and I didn't speak. And so I looked at my advocate and I said, you know, I don't think I want to do this. So I wrote a little letter, sent it to them that I don't think I'm the person because I feel like I'm just sitting there. I'm the, to what we would say as a token. Hmm. And a couple of years later, they said they want me to be on the board. And I stood up at the meeting and I said, I'm here to represent not only Loretta Claiborne, but the athletes of Special Olympics Pennsylvania. I would accept your position on the board, but I should have the same right to questions and answers as everyone else. 
and I hope that I can make Special Olympics program a more stronger program by hearing from the voices of our athletes. And I think that's what kicked it off. That second time I went to them, that meeting, and that was in 1989. And it, that, takes, that started the ball rolling. That takes a lot of guts. And I, I'm, so I'm gonna bring back the, the, the fear or faith over fear and fearlessness. I've heard you use the word fearlessness a lot when it comes to your mother, your mother. Yes, who, she was fearless. Yeah, t tell us about her a little bit. My mother raised seven children on her own. And actually she really had nine and she raised her, her children single-handedly. And I can remember her as something would happen in the community. My mother was there and if something happened with one of her kids, she did everything. She wanted to get the grain for her kids to get the proper care. And I remember one time going to the doctors and the, the dentist and the dentist took my sisters and did all their teeth. And she, the dentist looked at her and says, oh, Miss Claiborne, I can't do her teeth. You have to take her to the clinic. Those children, you know, I like use the word those in front of people is a strike to me. And my mom was fearless. She says, I tell you what, I'm gonna get my child's teeth done because my children are me. And I want, what I want for my other six is what I want for, for all seven, not just for six. I have seven children. I don't have six. My mom, she was always, she was into something. They would come to her. We lived in a big housing project. First thing you know, something happened. They were down at Miss Claiborne's house. She was like the go-to person. Oh, this is happening. And my mom was fearless. She was not afraid to step back against anyone. Hmm. She would step up to you. She was like Eunice Kennedy Schreiber was about people with intellectual disability. When she started Special Olympics, the country was at odds. Blacks wasn't liking whites, whites wasn't liking blacks. And then here's this woman, she's fearless about having a program for people in 1968 who weren't even thought about or didn't want to be thought about about society. And she made it happen because she was fearless. She stood up, she didn't take no for an answer. And that's how my mom was. Mm -hmm. My mom would always say to me, look, you got a mouth, you better learn how to use it. And she would always say to me, Silence is like cancer, it grows. Hmm. So don't be silent. If you sit there and be silent, they're gonna run over you. Loretta, I wanna talk about the role that sport has played in your life, obviously. Big um, role. Big role, you're a, a multiple gold medalist. You've run over 25 marathons. I know you still are competitive. Um, so how did you discover that, that that really fueled you? My brother Hank would take me out and he was a runner himself. He ran high school track. He was state cross country champ. And I knew that I could go out and follow him because my mom looked up to my brother. He was like the man of the house and I would follow him. And any time I was with my brother, my mom said, well, I don't have to worry about her, you know, raising five girls and two boys. I don't have to worry about Loretta because she's with Hank. And he would go running and I would just follow him and he would take me like under his wing and run out from where we lived at to the local college and he'd run around the track and he'd see me running and walking until I built that up. Well, then there was no title now, nine. Mm -hmm. Girls couldn't do sport. We played half court basketball in gym class. You don't remember those days. And I was just in the sport. I went out for the what they call the Physical Fitness Award, which was created by uh, Gov President Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. And you got to a certain level in school when you did these seven disciplines of sport. And my teacher says, oh, special ed kids don't get that. But I could outrun every kid in the school. I could do push-ups. I never learned that on my knees. I had one gym teacher says, oh, you're not going to get the Physical Fitness Award because you do your push-ups like a boy and you're supposed to do them on your knees. <laughs> What? You talk about, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I did not get the award that year in her class. Wow. I didn't get it to like when I was in 11th or 12th grade and all those years I tried out, but it was this one of sport was always a love for me. It was my way to speak out. It was my way to do something without getting angry, without taking somebody's head off, beating them up. Sport was like for me, I guess it was mm -hmm. like a, the mechanism 
everybody has something that they could do well. And that was something I could do well, even though I kept getting pushed back. Oh, you can't be in this and you can't be in that. And I actually helped start the first girls track team in my high school. I need to ask you of, of all of the accomplishments that, that you've had, all of the incredible things you've done, the stages you've been on, the presidents you've met, the people you've met, is there a particular moment that stands out to you? You know, there's so many moments, whether it's uh, one of the moments that sticks out to me, a lot of people says, oh, would you say going to see the Pope or going to see the president? You know, there are so many, I don't know where to start, but I know one thing that sticks out to me that I was very, very blessed to have Special Olympics because Special Olympics has driven me away that I met so many other people through it. Mm. The Masons, uh, the Myerses, people who were able to help me get through, mentor me in a way. If I have a question, if I have something serious, I can't go to a family member. I can get on the phone and I could call one of these friends. I was really depressed first with COVID. My friend says, why don't you get, come on out here. And I came out here. I had a couple of my meetings and I was out here for seven, seven weeks. I might want to go home for another two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. But to have the good people that I have met along the way. Going to see the White House was nice. Going to meet presidents, meeting Warren Buff Buffett. That was nice. But I think it's just... Special Olympics, having the gift of being able to be a part of when people were told me, you can't be in this, you can't be in that, even though I started attracting, Special Olympics was a place that I could be in. Mm -hmm. And along that road of being in Special Olympics, because I was very angry and I took a lot of medication. The medicine went away and I kind of, do I still get angry? Oh, yes, I do. I can be, get bitter but I know I can call up on the phone instead of tearing up everything or going through somebody. I'll call up on the phone and say, Hey, Linda, I need some help. Hey, Nora, I need some help. Hey, Becky, I need some help. It was the people along the way that I met that helped me get through this thing called life. Maybe this would be the same advice. I'll ask you because we leave our guests with this question every week. What advice would you give to yourself as a younger person, a young Loretta Claiborne? Uh, I would give my, I guess, I don't know I, what advice I would give myself, but I know one thing, I, if I was a young Loretta Claiborne, like I was, I hope that Special Olympics would be able to be here to do for our athletes of the future, both with and without intellectual disability coming together in the school to say to them, even if it's a child without intellectual disability who might be going through a hard time in the school, join us. Come to the students who have a unified sports program in their schools and get into it. Because if I was a young kid, I would eat that up because that is something I did not and I always wanted to experience in my school life was mm -hmm. to be in something that everyone is in. And that's what mm -hmm. our unified sports program does. That's something I would, I just look at and I would say, boy, my dream is your reality when I see children today with and without intellectual disabilities having that experience in school because school is your most important part of your life. You'll never forget that. We are so lucky to have you. The world is lucky to have you. Loretta, thank you so much for this. And thank you.